two, 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 and a mic. In this episode, I am once again joined by Karin. With her gentle analysis and subtle prodding, Karin places her finger unerringly upon the weaknesses of government and society where needs be to present an unobtrusive and yet real critique of where we are. Governments must be looked at and studied on the basis of their character and makeup, the time in which they govern and the events that define their terms. It is no use sitting upon the war horse of democracy and slaying the tyrants about us with the sharpest pen in the land. We need to understand, we need to be clear, and we need to demand. There are a great many things wrong in our world today. We should ideally strive to be rid of as many of them as possible by tomorrow. What ensues? is a meandering debate with Karin that takes in these issues and also throws in a few important others. Once again, thank you Karin for your time and your thoughts and your patience. I am joined again by Karin, my um, ever dependable uh, co-conspirator, somebody who has remained uh, steadfast in in supporting uh, this, these conversations and these debates, but more than that, who brings specific uh, dynamism, knowledge, uh, and experience to the argument table. Hello, Karin. How are you? Hello, Zach. I'm fine. How are you? Yeah. Good. And excuse my voice. It it go comes and goes. Yeah. That's okay. The, the the background to everything that we do is that you always have a voice, whether it is loud or quiet. <laughs> is a different whether it's matter. cracking or not, right. <laughs> My mind isn't cracking yet, yes. Not at all, very far from it. Um, and we are the, um, the, the, how can I say, the, uh, the happy beneficiaries uh, of this fact. So, um, yeah, last week we talked a little bit about, well, quite a bit actually, um, about Article 19. Um, But also you introduced Article 4 of of the Penn Charter, which went further into details, which will also cover some elements of what we want to talk about today. But essentially today is mainly about what the beginning is actually part one is mainly about the role of government in in protecting public interests. And, um, you know, I will I will leave that. As it is, I don't want to uh, unduly influence people's thoughts on that. Um, yeah, Karin, I mean, if somebody says to you, what is the role of government in protecting the public interest? Um, wh- what are some of the first thoughts that come to your mind? It's um, there to protect the life and livelihood of its people. And to manage the interaction among the people. That's to me what government should be and hopefully in most cases is, at least in our uh, world. I don't have uh, high flying uh, ideas about uh, what government, the powers of government, uh, what they Uh, are allowed to and not allowed to do. It varies according to uh, events. It varies according to times. It varies according to who is in power. Because if we vote for people, we give them power to uh, arrange our lives to a certain degree. And if that um, power is misused, we have the right to go against it and um, not 
uh, abide by the rules and laws that have been set by that particular government. There is a right to resist. Mm. Well, I mean, that, that in itself is very interesting because in, in many l sort of constitutions or even those which are uncodified, but there are laws in place to prevent uprisings. And some of these laws exist on the basis of public safety. Uh, however, you know, a very, very cynical eye would probably turn around and say, well, actually, one minute, that's there to protect the government itself. So, you know, um, not being able to incite, as it were, hatred can also be manipulated. Um, the some kind of control with regards to congregation so not many people are allowed to gather in a certain place perhaps limiting uh, the right to peaceful protest in areas you know in some cases and so on you know, these additional laws which are being sought out by governments in some cases which already exist in various other uh, places it seems to be like a, a legalized control mechanism to prevent what you say is perhaps a human right uh well, a human right is also uh, a, a responsibility. And we know that there are irresponsible uprisings and um, for, for particular interests of a class of people or a profession of people or um, any group of, of persons who want special other rights, um, it's, it, always cuts both ways. Um, the freedom we have is a responsibility to behave like people, human, humane. And my right, my freedom stops where I infringe on the freedom and the rights of others. And that is, it is a give and take. There's no absolute power to uh, government. There is no absolute um, necess uh, necessity, yes, but a right to transparency if it is um, restricted for the benefit of all. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought in transparency. I mean, I did want to um, refer back to that, but it's 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 it is important to bring it in here as well because. W I think transparency is an issue which pretty much came up maybe in the 90s and since then we've been talking about it with far greater either regularity or greater emphasis because there is now the possibility for transparency. We have access to information which before the 1990s simply did not exist. We have the ability to store data to store media files, videos, pictures and so on that we just could not do before the 90s. Um, but I, I'm not sure. I mean, how do you feel? Do you think governments are ready for transparency? Because, I mean, they still try to hide things. They still try to um, pass for laws. Their own benefit, yes, they do of that. Course. They still yeah, of course. Do that. I mean, uh, the, the right to transparency or the discussion on transparency, um, I um, got into first in the 90s, and it was within the uh, writers in prison uh, context, and it was with people responsible or um, voted in by, pe by the people or by a group of people into organizations that were dealing with transparencies. And the, the non-strange thing was uh, Russia was in the forefront. It was a group of not necessarily uh, staunch uh, defenders of the Russian constitution or the Russian government, but they were fighting hardest for transparency. And this is how I got into, into uh, thinking about it. It began where transparency was non-existence in our countries where the freedom to write about grievances was far more established, we had less reason to um, go all out and um, 
this has developed since the 90s through the explosion of data and uh, the possibility of entering uh, data banks um, that we need transparency wherever we are in all kinds of governments in all kinds of uh, civilizations and um, but again we have to always um, have in mind that even there are restrictions to absolute transparency um, in terms, for instance, of uh, of disease, of uh, something that goes around and uh, would um, bring the country to a standstill if it's not um, divulged in 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 intervals or in with sensitivity and all these things have an influence on where what transparency should be is it uh, all out uh, information is it uh, totally free internet is it totally free access to government uh, papers and uh, their discussions or to a private person's uh, inter uh, interaction with others. Um, it is on so many different levels. Um, we we can't just um, keep these things as um, freedom of expression, uh, transparency, uh, uh, a lot of other things. We cannot set them as absolutes. We do not have a world where anything is absolute, which means we have to be more educated and more aware of all the aspects and all the ramifications of what we are dealing with and the world we are dealing with and we are living in. Um, that I'm, as you can tell, I'm hesitant of going all out saying, you know, we need transparency wherever we are. We need well, it, yes? Yes? Yeah, no, I didn't want to interrupt your sentence. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to time my intrusion so, so, no, so that I arrive just as ahead. you complete it. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, because it's, when you say that, I, and I'm also referring to some of the your earlier statements, our ability to actually consume this information is so severely limited mm -hmm. that it almost makes the concept of transparency, whether it is complete, absolute or half, um, almost uh, unnecessary uh, as a consideration because the system that we have is such that people have to work. And as we get older, or as a gen sort of because of the generational change and people are living longer and so on, thankfully, people have to work even longer later on into their career. So, you know, we are living longer, so we have to pay for um, our extended lives by working two, three, four years longer than we would have done um, in previous generations. What this means is that we no longer have the ability maybe we never have had uh, the ability never had. yeah to consume the data that has been collated so yeah. even if the government completely opens up its hard drives we are not able to go in there and find out all the things that we want so therefore that leads us to a slightly different question which is i think also an area where you are more uh, knowledgeable in um the the importance of writers, researchers, and journalists, because these are people whose careers are based on the ability to go into a situation, whether that is physically or whether that is jumping into a data library and doing the research themselves, pulling out what is necessary and creating a coherent line of thought in either an article, an essay, or a book, which people can then consume in the evenings when they are at liberty to do so. Does, does, is, this, is this sort of extremely long-winded question? That's, uh, 
but yeah. that's that's a very important uh, question. It's it's not just a question; it's a statement, which I fully agree with. Because my next sentence was going to be: since we cannot um, work with all the data that is around us, or nobody can, nobody ever has been able to, uh, even in uh, with the data that was available 2000 years ago they did not there was not one man or woman who could really analyze and come to a conclusion about the whole of it um so we need representatives to go in and analyze what is around us and these analysts in terms of uh data and um political um, I nearly said would say uh, shenanigans. Um, we need the journalist, we need the press, we need the media. At the same time, um, they are people and they have their interests. And how do you balance, how do you check on those who know more and have more access than you have? Um, I don't want to be left in the lurch because I don't know everything and I don't want anybody in this world to be left behind because they don't have access to all this information, uh, all this information and all these um, analyses and syntheses and uh, conclusions and questions and answers. Um, we have to be able to rely on decent, informed um, representatives who do that for us. But we also have to have some way of checking on them. You know, the, the uh, shortcomings of the press when a journalist makes up sources, for instance, which happened a couple of times in 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 the last um, or got into the news a couple of times during the last two years. Um, they were once they were found out, they were um, sidelined. Yes. But all those people who had believed what they had said um, were betrayed. And could that have been prevented? This is what is there. Is there a medium or a, a organization that checks on those who gather the information and analyze it and bring it back to us in concise form? Um, is there anybody who can check on them? Because I don't want the government or the government uh, strata to be responsible to check on those we asked to represent our need for knowledge. Yeah, I, I, it's also very telling, I think, that we we are still incapable of putting together uh, a correct I want to say the word unbiased, but as you suggested yourself, the, the term doesn't really have a practical application in this case. But as much as we can get to having an objective analysis picture, perhaps even just of, a, of our own history, let alone what is happening today, which happens at such a fast speed that we, we aren't really even uh, capable of understanding all of the complexities of it. So, you know, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, we've got people talking about, you know, how did you leave these people behind? Quite justifiably so. Mm -hmm. um, but just to say that doesn't also doesn't paint the correct picture because there are there's so much information that is missing. It's simple to turn around and, and just say, why were you not ready? Um, the question, I think, is uh, is undercooked because we're giving an opportunity for people to say you don't know what the situation really was. We should, for example, load the question with additional information by saying how come it was possible that the French were able to get all of their people and dependents out by the end of July? Right. 
and yet the rest of you were not able to? What did the French know that you didn't know? Or how did the French feel about their planning that you did not feel? So um, you know, th thereby we have given a little bit more information and that makes it a bit more difficult for our representatives to wriggle out from beneath the responsibility. Yes, and we should do that much more often. But who in our country reads the press or listens to the radio or uh, watches television or reads papers uh, that closely that they know the right questions? Um, we have people who are not interested in Afghanistan. We have people who are not interested in what is going on and why why it's going on and who is uh, wrong or right. Um, I'm always reminded of the fact that there is a lot of, let me say it the harsh way, ignorance, voluntarily ignorant, uh, dealing with our world because they can't they can't carry the load of the, all that information and they don't have the technique or the means because they have not been trained to deal with that much information and they are uh, they cannot ask the right questions like why could the French uh, get out of uh, out of the country which is something you and I read some time ago and again today. Um, and this is part of our question to what we would like to ask the people who were in charge. And I'm very, very um, disappointed in the quality of leadership basically around the world. And Oops. it's, yeah. Yep, no, please. And um, and I don't see any means and ways of changing that, because um, I said there is no nothing that is absolute, um, as Einstein would agree with. Um, I've become more and more humble in my. Uh, questions and in my demands for answers, uh, the older I get. Because uh, we cannot know everything. I see it in my own field. I cannot, I cannot take in all the information. And I've stopped even trying a long time ago um, about German literature. Um, there is so much. When you go to the book fair and you have uh, 60,000 new or 80,000 uh, new books on display, um, not all those part of German literature, but uh, a lot of them are, uh, I, I, I give up. I start picking out very, very consciously certain parts of information. And when I read a newspaper, Today, I read what I want to read and what I'm interested in, where I know something about the background, uh, which may be more than in other other people have. But um, I refuse to read what doesn't touch me, what I cannot work into my world in, in any one uh, shape or form, because uh, Either I don't know the background, it does not phase my world, it does not enter into my philosophy of life, and I simply say no. And this no comes from saying we cannot know everything. We can, even in, in terms of all the questions we've been dealing with, um, we discuss... Um, our demands on uh, democracy, on our leadership. Um, 
but at the same time, um, we are never quite fair. We don't know enough. And at the same time, we must look into all kinds of sources. You can't, I said that before, you cannot just read one paper to be informed. You cannot read, uh, listen to one radio station. Um, you cannot uh, listen to uh, or watch television, one station. You have to go wider. And for that width, again, we need more education. We need more education in terms of language, in terms of politics, in terms of understanding what we are all about. Mm. And you see, I'm I'm dealing with what you said, and I agree. But I, my my uh, thoughts go um, more more around mm. and go. Um, through what I've experienced and what I worked on and with, um, they go into, sometimes into, into uh, width that, uh, into, into breadth that uh, scare me myself because I touch on them and I can't analyze them. I cannot uh, explain them. And, and yet, by doing so, you were still uh, showing or, or giving us a window uh, into activities which you conducted within your your career, working with Penn and also um, yeah, your other organizations where normal or your average person perhaps wouldn't have uh, the ability to see what was happening and so therefore consider the issue from those perspectives. Um, yeah, another interesting aspect of, of the conversation is also the inclusion of different um, genders within the topic. So yes. normally when we talk about the control of information or um, domestic policy, this is very much conducted by Conservatives, I should say, with a small c, uh, because you have conservatives with a small c on both sides of the political divide. But generally, men, mm -hmm. it's it's th there is perhaps a very strong argument, and I'm I'm saying perhaps because I don't want to throw in um, another absolutism. There is perhaps a very good argument to say that there is a greater possibility that government will open up, will be more um progressive will be more open to communication will be more empathetic of the needs of public if other genders were involved within the process and clearly i'm talking about allowing more women to operate not only uh, on the, the surface and that means by having um, more female leaders and ministers but also by having more genders represented within the entire civil service, which I would imagine still remains very much dominated by white men. Uh, I give one example, which I recently came across by seeing a documentary, I think it was created by ZDF, um, and it was about, it focused on Taiwan's new digital minister, Audrey Tang, who is a transgender software programmer who has become the digital minister with the the main target of making government in Taiwan open. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, I find it fascinating that, you know, A, we would have a, a transgender minister in Taiwan um, and B, that the one of the main targets of of this minister would be to make government more open. And yes. why is it that in Taiwan uh, this is a perfectly manageable situation. And yet, I, I don't recall a single transgender minister in the UK, nor I believe in Germany. No, you are wonderful because you're concrete. Um, I'm less concrete. I'm always thinking around concrete situations and try to analyze the, the ramifications. Um, I look at the 
young generation of girls, young women, women who are uh, 40 and 50. And I'm so happy that they do not grow up with the uh, self-doubt that I grew up with. I was super shy. I did not dare even outside of my family and my group of friends uh, to venture out and do a lot of things. And this has followed me throughout my life. But I see now that the next generation has a simple, nor a natural reaction to here we are. Come on, deal with us. And the younger they are, the more, um, the less restricted they've been brought up in most parts of Europe, I know. Um, and I'm very proud of the fact that this is happening. During the time when I was young, I did not even think of going into politics. There were two or three, four, five women who came in and were uh, accepted by the male society. Um, it's not the fact that there are more uh, heads of state now, or heads of government, who are women. I think um, in all our countries, we need diversity in, in the most wide, in the widest sense, because we need people from all backgrounds. We need people from all sexual um, uh, gender uh, diversity. We need people of all ethnic background who live with us in, they live with us in one country. We need the diversity more bitterly than ever before, because without their support and without their knowledge and different experience, how is anybody going to govern our country? They have to be allowed to be more vocal and to be more participating in all uh, status of uh, government, of public service, and particularly of education. Which, which does also beg the question about the transparency which relates to the decision-making process. Now, we have often heard the word or term quota, yeah, I suppose in Germany, Mitarbeiter, as in, you know, th this is somebody who works with us because of the quota. That's the only reason. It's a quota, quota Frau. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think uh, I've heard a Oops, couple of times. Yeah. Say, um, which it's a completely ridiculous term to throw at something. But anyway, if you've got one woman among six, um, all of a sudden um, there is a term to criticize the woman's presence. I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't to it? To exclude just, her again. Yeah, exactly. Um, how ridiculous. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't want to get uh, carried away with that um, on this particular point. The issue, however, is that it's obviously much more difficult if you are the one among the seven. So this is the individual upon whom the, the future trail or pathway for women and for other genders to follow has to be blazed. So um, if there is a woman who sits on the on the on the board um, of directors of a certain organization, there is so much pressure on her um, to, to be able to a do the job that uh, she's there for. And I, I have no doubt that there is absolute ability in that person to to be able to manage the job. The problem is having to at the same time deal with all the little piranhas uh, which are nibbling at her feet. Uh, as she tries to go about her daily tasks. If we can remove all of these, if we can actually go into the nitty gritty of the decision making process, why is it that it is so damn difficult to open up the, the corridors of power to diversity? Why do these people want to keep control of those damn dark corridors for so long? I mean, they've screwed up so much. What is the point? They will say we never screw up anything and we have to defend ourselves against the next uh, white male that's standing there to 
take our job and take our power. Um, it's the competition among the men that in to a large degree um, does not allow women into the into the group into into um, it does it's not sufficient if a woman is elected to some position or is uh, voted in to uh, deal with with uh, important part of uh, a company um, she is not just the outsider because she's a woman she is the outsider because she is not a man because the men among themselves have such difficulty of really team working the, the only real teamwork i've ever experienced was with women and maybe there was one or two men who uh, joined us in working together, and it always worked better than than anything else. Um, it's a it's the male prerogative that we haven't chipped at enough yet. The male prerogative is is a farce. It's a myth, and to me, it makes them smaller than they are if they don't work with other people, male or female, and particularly with people who bring in a totally no, n new um, emotion into, into business and into politics. And that's, that's the role of women coming in. That's definitely one of the roles. I, I would absolutely concede that. Um, and, and I would also add that there are many, many men. I am by far from being an exception. Um, the vast majority of men that I have spoken to are extremely supportive of the concept of any concept which comes to bringing forward greater diversity within their um, within their departments. If they're managers, then they then you know in my conversations with them they have said yes we you know, we look at many different ways whether that's from the language of the initial job ad to the interviewing process to the decisions behind the interviewing decisions um, for hiring and so on and um, all of these things are uh, you know are looked at are modernized um, and are also shared with female colleagues to try to increase the level of diversity within their organization. So there is a lot of development. However, Thank the problem you. is, yeah, but the problem is, is the problem isn't the kind of people that I would communicate with. It seems to me the problem is with those individuals who have grown up and have somehow become embroiled with or involved in this old boy network because these are the people who automatically have access to powerful friends um, who get the powerful jobs because of their personal acquaintances. And these are the people who tend to push out the, the ones who want to be more progressive, who want to be more diverse, because yes. it's not in their interests. And until those groups, and it's an extremely small minority, I don't want to necessarily refer to them as elite because I think elitism is a, is a misnomer in this case because um, I think it's privileged. Exactly. Yeah, to be elite means to be the best. I don't think that's what they represent. Um, and so, therefore, yeah, these minorities um, have far too much access to power and don't allow your average individuals, male, female, or uh, the other genders which are represented in society to flourish. Mm -hmm. Very, very true. And I was just now being catapulted into back into uh, the America of the 1960s and 1970s, when in America, the first women came close to these power groups and got into these power groups. And that was because they had networked. They had networks in school. There, there were the fraternity, not just the fraternities, there were the sororities who helped each other and there was no backbiting. And that generation um, 
got into most every echelon of society in America. And I'm thinking of, of the, okay, limited amount of people I can look back on who I knew in college uh, at Texas or later in uh, Cincinnati. Uh, they made their way very well. And they did not let the male prerogative uh, keep them out. Um, so it is also a lack of networking among women in our society. There's no, no sorority uh, at the university here um, where people can make these connections. And these connections are made in school, at the university, uh, through parents, through the group that uh, the parents deal with, uh, have business with. That is very, very much still male oriented. And particularly in the um, in the median uh, part of industry or commerce or in in the smaller town communities there it's still much more alive that the male um, networks uh, have the upper hand and in, in fact uh, I think a, a big part of what you are saying there with the, the lack of this network um, is being addressed bit by bit. I'm I've yes. I've come to know um, groups on, for example, LinkedIn, um, such as uh, Safe Circles, where they have planned uh, an event called the Hackathon, where they are bringing together lots of uh, technology entrepreneurs and businesses uh, to create safe spaces uh, for girls and women. Uh, to either uh, online or indeed in, in real life f f to, to act as a kind of protective mechanism to allow them to grow and to reach their, uh, the, to sort of fulfill their potential as opposed to being permanently hindered by the, the, the status quo. And, but the unfortunate thing is that it, it so often takes uh, a tragic event um, for these kinds of groups not to come about because they've always existed. They've, all, they've existed in every generation. Yes. But for them to be heard requires a tragic event. It's yes. very similar with the Black Lives Matter. Um, and you know, this is something which we are we're looking at now. So in, in, in March in the UK, this uh, young lady, Sarah Everard, um, was kidnapped, raped and killed by a, a policeman um, of all people. And um, obviously the uproar was justifiably immense. And finally, now we're seeing um, a lot of support for movements, for networks to create these uh, these kinds of safe spaces. And Safe Circles is, is just one of those organizations. Hera City, which is also looking to create um, a city designed specifically with women in mind, um, it is also a fantastic project, which is currently ongoing too. So, I mean, these things are starting to really motor ahead and they gives, they do give a person um, that sort of warm feeling that maybe things have taken a turn for the better. This was a young woman who brought me some material on the Green Party. Fantastic, and the election. Isn't it? it was a woman, of course. Fantastic. Yeah, OK. Uh, unfortunately, um, the, the women seem to be more uh, dynamic when it comes to doing these kinds of jobs rather than the men. But We've been uh, cornered in these shops for a long, long while. Mm. Who was uh, folding um, the papers or the envelopes for mass distribution? It was always the women. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I, I did it myself in my youth group back in London. But um, there, yeah, I think generally speaking, this does, uh, this was at least the, was. the premise of women. Um, and but this is also still the case when, for example, if you say that there's one, there's one member of the board, 
is that's a woman and everybody says i bet you it's human resources director mm -hmm. um yeah, which is another um you know sort of position which women have been cornered into uh, accepting don't these people realize what a waste of talent of energy of prosperity of good living the exclusion of women is or has been I, I, unfortunately, I don't think they realize, but I'm, th this is the main reason why, I, uh, other than the fact that I believe in absolute equality, but this is the main reason why I'm such a big supporter and I'd like to become an even bigger ally of all of these um, you know, gender equality movements is because we have already lost out so much over these you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of, of keeping women down that it's impossible to to overstate the point. I can never prove it, but I just know it. Yes. And the, the longer that we allow this to continue, the, the more we are depriving um, our future generations of a happy life. As it is climate change, you know, I'm, I just have a feeling that if in the 1960s there were more women in charge, there's no way that uh, our governments would have allowed the situation to develop when they knew the reality of the situation. It, I just don't think it would have happened. Right. Absolutely. Um, I have uh, been cl very close to the um, movement in America, the NOW movement for women. Um, all these at that point, we were absolutely sure that um, equality among the uh, the races, and there's no, there's one race, one human race, and we still talk about races, um, backgrounds of people um, would be over with. Um, and then came the riots, and then came. Uh, came a rollback and then it came a rollback for women and this has been happening over and over again in throughout the centuries that if there was some progress there was also also a rollback uh, and I just hope that uh, Black Lives Matter uh, stays as strong as it is or gets a lot stronger and I wish all the women who are now fighting for their jobs or enjoying what they're doing in their jobs with others, that they have uh, the power in terms of not Macht, but um, the, the energy to keep going and do the best they can and make a change. I, I, I have to say, I can sense such single-minded determination nowadays among women to immediately spring up when they feel that they are not being treated equally by especially men um, within group discussions um, but in, in general you know and, and I think it's actually a good skill to to develop if you feel as though your voice is being uh, pushed down. Um, if you feel as though you're not being given a fair crack of the whip, you know, don't accept that. You've got something to say, say it. Uh, don't be afraid to to raise your voice. And you know, I can see that. I can see it in an online discussion when um, you know I, I follow lots of different groups and communities, and, and when you see that there is a woman or um, you know, a, a trans person communicating. Um, and then somebody else comes in with, a, you know, a completely different um, and contradictory statement. They refuse to accept it. They don't sort of back down and say, OK, OK, and stop writing. No, they come back and they say, no, you're wrong. And this is why you're wrong. And it's so refreshing to see that because it wasn't always the case. No, because uh, we didn't have that uh, communications uh, network uh, that is possible today. Um, we were fighting uh, basically uh, excommunia excommunicado. We, we fought for, with a few others. Our, our range of support was not there. And um, it, the, the uh, networking on 
line is so much faster, so much more encompassing. And at the same time, it's dangerous and it's beneficial. And I'm glad you see a lot of beneficial aspects uh, of this communication. Uh, I stayed out of it, I must say, uh, totally, uh, because I oh, didn't think anybody needed my information or needed my input, and I wasn't ready to go on fighting. I was I was tired of fighting because all my life I had um, through the shyness that was ingrained in my being. I hardly ever fought for myself. I could fight for others, but I couldn't fight for myself. And I've been through um, working on a book for, for a professor for a year and seen my uh name uh, next to the secretary who painted to who typed it I've uh, seen um, people um, present my findings or my uh, input uh, as soon as a television camera was in in sight on site or uh, a mic was nearby it was always um, a choice in one way and a lack of, I don't want to make a mess, I don't want to make a fuss. But the main choice was if they presented what I had worked on and come uh, uh, to the conclusions I'd come to, if they presented them all right, it it was fine. It was always the, con the, the work for the people. It was always the... Um, it wasn't because I had done anything. It was that something was done for those who needed it most. And this is uh, still uh, part of my makeup. Yeah, I, I I understand that because I think we are quite similar in that characteristic. This this the the understanding that the work is for the benefit of the community. And as a result, our own personal ego doesn't really factor into the, the the argument. The important thing is the work that we do. You know, are we committed to the work? It's not a question of reaching uh, a certain level of status within the organization mm -hmm. as a result. I, I've come, however, around a little bit to to seeing this as actually being uh, a very short sighted approach. Because if we are willing to allow somebody else to steal our concepts, our approaches, methods, ideologies for their own aggrandissement, then what we are essentially doing is allowing the community to believe that the person who stands before them is a sincere, committed member of the team who's working on their behalf. But really, we are complicit in allowing a deceiver to maintain a platform they should not have. Do you um, see what I mean? I, in, I see what you mean. My experience is that they um, disqualified themselves uh, th throughout their operations, that everybody saw and uh, realized what was going on, even the people who had um, had brought the mic and were uh, interviewing him. Uh, it was usually a man. And um, at the same time, um, I never felt that uh, I was looked at as second best when when we came out in the open, because most everybody knew they knew the method, they knew the person, and they knew who was doing what. So uh, in that sense, I I was not in in a uh, was, uh, I was not in in industry or commerce or whatever. I was in 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 a 
association servicing uh, our profession, which uh, means we knew one another, we knew uh, the way the world inside our organization was happening. And uh, you had the silent okay from the others that's that's a different thing than being out in the in in the rough world of of making money but uh, no i i do regret yes that i could not be much more forceful uh, or wasn't much more forceful but i went the other way i went, I call this, called it, uh, if I can't do it above board, I do it subversively. Mm. Um, I went around these, uh, these mechanisms uh, to get things done the way I wanted them done. And there I was relatively successful. And in that sense, I'm satisfied. Yeah, good. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to in any way um yeah inspire within you any sentiment no, no, of regret no. because I, I, that's not fair the point that i wanted to make was not for uh, any supposed mistake that you may have made no no i'm i didn't uh, uh, hear that either mm, okay. and i uh, i always <laughs> <laughs> no 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 come on we trust one yeah. another don't we no no of course but i'm referring um, to mistakes that i made personally with regards to that and again i don't regret it because i think that i made those mistakes for the same reasons that you would have made your decisions um which were the, for the benefit of the community my only concern uh, in voicing the opinion was that you know whoever hears this if they are in a similar situation you know, it's not a question of ego. Absolutely. Speak up. It's not a question of ego. You're not promoting yourself. You're promoting the right approach to the people who need it. Right. And, and that's the issue. It's not the person necessarily. If the person before you is capable of doing the job in the right way and you are um, convinced of this fact, then of course there's no need to speak up if you don't wish to. Right. But if you see that it's, uh, what they're doing is actually contrary to their real values, their secret divisive values, then jump in there, let them know, create havoc if necessary, yes. but get, get them the hell out of there. I think among the two generations of women that are right now around you, you also see the difference between uh, the older generation more shy, although there was no need to be shy or to uh, stand back. And the younger generation who knows very well what they are worth. Mm. And uh, I'm very, very happy about, I know I know the people you, you are with. Mm -hmm. So give them my love because I think uh, they're the, the differentiation or the, the promotion of self-esteem from one generation to the next has worked as well. Mm. Yeah, I believe so as well. And uh, in, in fact, that tr the transference um, of, um, you know, not necessarily saying don't be like me, but the transference of communication meaning make sure you are more you. Yes. Um, and I, I do think that is a yeah, that, that was a powerful message, which has been well received by the individual that you are right. referring to, right. indeed. Right. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, Carolyn, we've already pushed through the one hour mark and um, I'm, I'm tempted to leave the, um, the lady who represented the Greens in, um, even though I don't necessarily have her permission uh, to do so. But I hope she won't mind. We won't name her. Um, the, but the one who came and uh, knocked on your door and left you the leaflet. Um, but thank you very much again. Um, just as a side note, uh, a very quick uh, question, because we've got the, the elections coming up and um, I, I'm hopeful that we will be able to also have a podcast with regards to the elections and analysing what may have happened and so on. Um, I, how do you feel about the current state of the polls and do you trust the polls? Um, I, I don't think 
it's important to trust the polls. It's uh, trust your own reaction to the people who um, present themselves as the representatives of the parties. Um, but never forget the um, program of the parties themselves, because it's not just the um, the so-called candidates who will be governing our state uh, after the election. It will be the setup that is supporting them. So um, I have till now not really very closely followed what every party does or says. Um, of course, I'm in, I'm informed what every one of these parties is about. And there's been such an up and down among the parties, particularly among the CDU and uh, SPD, that um, I think we will have a lot of things to talk about once it's clear what, who is who and what is what. And we can talk about it the next time, yes. Absolutely. I think it would be nice to to sort of jump into that uh, a little bit of a, of, a, of an analysis. We can add our uh, recipe to the cookbook of right. politics of Germany uh, in 2021. Um, yeah, Karin, thank you very much again. Um, we we meander, do we not? We do, and topic. sometimes I feel bad about it, but at the same time, um, it's such a um, I, I go about um, more on, on, on a, not f just philosophical, but um, an, a uh, on a, on, it's not level, it's, it's my type of analysis that has been with me. Um, while you are very, very concrete, and I think we correspond to one another and we bring the picture much better uh, together, the two of us, than either one alone. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will agree with anything, which means that uh, you and I are both uh, enjoying a conversation together. So uh, I will absolutely take that on um, as, as being the absolute truth. Uh, thank you very much for the, um, how should I say, uh, the, uh, how do they term it? I, I've forgotten. But for, for the meandering, shall we say, right. for, this, for the scenic route is what I was looking for through our discussion today. I thank uh, you. Sometimes the slalom is uh, long and sometimes it's <laughs> very short. Yes. Yeah, but it's fun. But it's so, it's yeah. fun. And I think it's more realistic than coming up with questions and answers uh, that are half cast. Yeah, and I was I, I I mean neither of us want to stick too rigidly to a particular format. So I mean it's it's always good to have um, these sort of uh, you know additional lines. But I mean I I've, I'm not particularly disciplined, and um, you don't need to be. So it's a it's a good combination. Um, thank you very much again. It's wonderful to be able to have these chats, and uh, long may they continue. They will and uh, talk to you next time. Absolutely. All the best. And Thank you. Two and a mic. Two and a mic.